with uh, uh, Gary Boyd, and then we'll have a talk by Lisa Galson. And um, I think we'll do this time. We'll do questions straight after uh, Gary's, because he might have to leave in the middle uh, if we don't. Um, yes, and. We're thinking since we started a bit late, we might not have like a break in between. We'll just go for it, and then if you guys fall asleep or are you really have to go to the bathroom, just say and we'll yeah. uh, do a break. So, yeah, and um, also just um, the about the Instagram as well. Um, if anybody has any more things to send in, or uh, the folders up on the drive, or it should be up on the drive. So just send it in there if you want to. No one considers it bragging. No. <laughs> it can be anonymous if you really want. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, this week's theme is material culture and social history. So, uh, yeah, I'll just uh, yeah, I'll say a few words about who Gary is. <laughs> um, so Gary Boyd is a professor of architecture at Queen's University. Uh, Belfast and uh, head of architecture, um, and his first book explored the influence of medicine, particularly obstetrics, uh, on the development of social life, architecture, and urban form in the early modern city. His book, Ordnance, War Plus Architecture and Space, looked at how strategies of warfare occupy and alter built and other landscapes. And in 2014, he was appointed joint curator slash commissioner uh, of the Irish Pavilion for the Architecture Biennale. Uh, and research from this Venice project led to another book which traces the impact of modern infrastructure on the cultural and architectural identity and development of the Irish state. And following this, he was appointed joint commissioner uh, curator for Making Ireland Modern, a major exhibition touring the Republic of Ireland in 2016 as one of the key strands in the Irish Arts Council's 1916 to, uh, to 2016 cultural program. And other research interests include the design of housing, prefabrication in architecture, curation and the representations of architecture, aspects of design urbanity, and the in, uh, architectures of industry and other forms of production. So, from Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope my introduction is uh, going to be uh, longer than my actual talk. But, uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, it's been a long time since I actually lectured in UCD because I used to teach here as well a long time ago. That's where I met you, first of all. So, uh, so great. It's nice to be here. Thanks very much, Ella and Gary and Hugh, for inviting me. I was just going to talk a bit about uh, this kind of what we might call a construct uh, of nighttime monto. So I guess this is the kind of social history of things. Just talking about this. I mean, I, I called it originally. I was just going to call it nighttime because I think the monto area, which we've been looking at in the contents of the Magdalen Asylum, is a, a kind of work of fiction as much as it's a work of fact. We might come to that in a second. But anyway, I was going to start, I'm not sure, you might have looked at all this stuff before, but I was going to start with this quotation by uh, James Joyce from uh, Ulysses. Uh, and it says, The Mabbot Street entrance to Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding, set with skeleton tracks, red and green, will-o'-the-wisps and danger signals. Rows of flimsy houses with gaping doors, rare lamps with rainbow fans, round Rabiotti's halted ice gondola, stunted men and women squabble. They grab wafers between which are wedged lumps of coal and copper snow. Sucking, they scatter slowly. Children, the swan comb of the gondola, high reared, forges through the muck, white and blue under a lighthouse. Whistles call and answer. And that's a uh, the night town, or something called the Circe chapter of Ulysses, which is written in uh, 1904, I think you can correct me on that. Uh, but what's interesting is I think it kind of introduces a series of inversions. Things are not quite the same. There's, there's kind of a heightened sense of the unreal, of the otherly, uh, which is conveyed within this. And uh, it seems to suggest that it's a series of strange happenings in this place. And he, and even the fact that he calls the Circe chapter of the Ulysses Circe was uh, the emasculating 
a kind of demigod who lives on an island and they all kind of you know, end up kind of being turned into animals on this island. So he's referring back to that as he does also, as you know, through the whole of uh, Ulysses. But there's something really interesting about this, which uh, I think because he's talking about this language, but he's also picking up on a particular language which was used in the 19th and early 20th century to talk about places like these, like this idea that these places were emasculating, were a danger to the masculine kind of a nation and were dominated by females. And some of that is true and some of that's not true. So for example, within a nighttime monto, apparently there was a series of kind of, a, what were called madams, who were kind of the, if you like, the modern day kind of female pimps for the prostitutes who worked there. But as I said before, we're not really sure because there's so much exaggeration which, are, which is always kind of leveled against these areas that they do become as much a work of fiction and a worse, a, a, as much a kind of idea of a kind of the febrile mind of the people who visited them uh, as they, they do a sense of reality. And the people who visited them, as we'll kind of find out in a minute, are generally male and middle class. So there's a kind of sense that they quite often misread actually what's on the ground. What's on the ground might actually be quite normal, quite everyday, but they're seeing within it a series of bizarre kind of uh, interludes, a series of bizarre adventures that they don't understand because of their background. So when you read things like this, and obviously James Joyce is, is fictionalizing this, but when you read some of the other kind of uh, suggestions, you can see that like there is much a reflection on the kind of position of the, the male, white, middle class person who visits the, these areas as they are a description of the areas themselves. So, well, you know this, I mean, he talks about he talks about the Mabbott Street entrance to Nighttown, which is just here, and you go underneath uh, our railway bridge, which is still there. So that still exists, but as you also know, very, very little of this fabric is still there, and uh, that's happened in waves, the disappearance, the erasure, if you like, of, of Monto has happened in a, over a series of kind of decades, and the most recent one was in the Celtic Tiger, where it started to become rapidly redeveloped. But before that, there was other reasons why it changed and changed quite rapidly. Monto, as you probably know, is um, it, it com comes from the name Montgomery Street, which is one of those streets here. Again, this matters from 1907, and by this stage, they've already changed a lot of the names because this area was notorious. It was in the kind of uh, the, the encyclopedia as uh, being suggested as quite a unique area, even within Europe by this stage. But in fact, areas like this. Uh, which apparently were dedicated to prostitution were kind of not that unusual in the 19th century. In fact, there was other areas in Dublin which were equally in inverted commas uh, notorious. So anyway, by this stage, I think Montgomery Street's actually gone. I can't remember what replaces it uh, in terms of the name. It's not Mabbott Street. It's not, I don't think it's Lord Tyrone Street. It's one of those anyway. So there's a kind of shifting of the name. They started to change the names and basically at the end, they start kind of erasing the whole a fabric of the area. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that fabric and a little bit about the origins of it. And the origins are kind of in this. This is Malton, uh, Thomas Malton, drawing and painting Dublin at the end of the 18th century. And uh, this series of, of paintings he made are generally seen to be the kind of this posh side of Dublin, this fantastic kind of theatrical side of Dublin where everything's kind of nice and dandy. This is the age of the ascendancy, this is uh, the age of the Anglo-Irish and big houses both in the countryside and big houses like this one here where it's a Charlemagne house being kind of reimagined within the city and then the relationship between that and uh, what became the Wide Street Commission, this, this kind of airy kind of spacious landscape where kind of posh people can kind of wander around and have a nice time in this kind of Protestant Anglo-Irish culture. But not so much in this one, but in many of uh, Malton's shots, he also kind of shows a slightly darker side or, or a kind of side from the poorer parts of Dublin. So quite often you'll find within this kind of emissaries from the kind of the backlands, if you like, kind of beggars, vagabonds, maybe the hint occasionally of prostitutes, etc. within them. So that's what's happening here. And then this site in particular has something also to do with Monto. This is the new pleasure gardens. 
uh, which is now the Rotunda Hospital uh, and was at the time uh, a maternity hospital as well, but had this very strange relationship between a maternity hospital, which is obviously about giving birth, and a pleasure gardens. And at that time in the 18th century, pleasure gardens had another reputation as being a place of illicit sexual encounter and prostitution. So this is kind of going on. So you just have to bear with me uh, when I say that there's a maternity hospital and a pleasure gardens on the same site and they're somehow related but not related. But then what happens, as you probably know from, from those who kind of know a little bit about uh, Dublin, what happens is these magnificent houses which here are in single occupancy, in other words one family occupies all that uh, house on their own with a bunch of servants and out the back would be kind of uh, quarters for uh, horses etc. What happens is after, well what, generally speaking what we think happens is generally speaking after the Act of Union in 1801 there is what's known as the flight of the gentry. All the posh people begin to leave and then the spaces they leave behind become kind of occupied increasingly by a higher density of population, and that population is a, a poor population. So by this stage, this is a, a photograph of Gardner Street, I think, in probably, it's probably the 1920s or maybe 1930s. Uh, and by this stage, uh, quite a lot of things have happened to the built fabric. It's become, a, it's become subdivided into a series of different places, a series of different units, if you like. So some of those, uh, some of those rooms will contain a whole family, uh, rather than a whole family within a house. You might have five or six uh, families within a, within a block itself. And they, they, this, this process was called tenementalization, if you like. And in Scotland, we call it the making down of, uh, of these posh houses into this kind of landscape. And something else has also happened because the, uh, the hierarchy of inside to outside and the relationship between the house and the streets changed as well because the front doors, which were the kind of, if you like, the threshold between the kind of public and private, have now become uh, theoretically and uh, physically thrown open. So what you have is these areas become quite porous. So it's possible from now, from, from in this photograph, to kind of pass through from Gardner Street through these houses to get into a series of back courts and then finally through another set of houses into another street. So the whole thing has become quite porous and quite a kind of a labyrinthine, I would say, in terms of how that's read, a, in terms of how we would understand Georgian houses and things. So that's kind of what's going on. So that's the process about when Monto is operational, or just after Monto is operational. Uh, and then we have this other image which shows uh, the, the pleasure gardens, as I mentioned before, uh, in the context of uh, the, the new city. So this is Rourke's map from 1747. And you can see there's a different kind of thing. There's a kind of idea of this medieval town which is squashed up here and the beginnings of a different way of understanding urban space with the Sackville Mall and then the Pleasure Gardens. And actually over here is another area of interest to your project which is the Marlborough Bowling Green. Uh, and it was also a resort of leisure, the kind of place where you go for culture, the place where different classes could actually meet, although they were generally upper class and middle class, but also the place where uh, illicit sexual encounters are alleged to have happened. And then Great Britain Street itself became uh, an area which was renowned for, this is now uh, Parnell Street, this, is, this, this became a, an area renowned for, for brothels and all this kind of activity. So there, we're, we're thinking about this at the kind of, so that's, th this is I suppose a physical context, there's a kind of cultural context there in the 18th century. Uh, and then what happens, well, just to say that, to kind of prove that point, for example, there is, this is, this is the, the pleasure gardens that the slide I showed earlier. There had been a wall which had been that wide, uh, or that tall rather, and then that was reduced. And this is now a guard house which is kind of used to kind of look out for kind of illicit nefarious activity. And then we also have a different type of surveillance here. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Pleasure Gardens here, Rotunda, uh, Rotunda Square, uh, or Parnell Square rather, uh, which is down like that. 
And there is a, there's a guardhouse at the opposite side as well, which is this one. But there's another form of surveillance there, which is the Bethesda Chapel, which was a chapel for fallen women. And they existed in uh, Dublin and elsewhere in the vicinity of places where uh, stuff was happening. A sexual congress was happening for it on a commercial basis. So there's one there, uh, and you'd be interested to know that there's actually one here as well. This is Stevens Green, and that's uh, the Magdalen Asylum there, which is now the Sugar Club. Uh, but that was quite a famous and quite a large Magdalen Asylum, which had uh, a relationship to Stevens Green as well. In fact, the spire there was large uh, and tall, so you can see it from within the uh, within the, uh, the the green itself. And apparently, it inspired kind of some prostitutes to give up their life of illicit sin and uh, kind of submit themselves to the to the to the Magdalen Asylum. So back here, uh, and I see your maps on the wall as well. We have the beginnings of Monto. I mean, the beginnings of, uh, the, 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 first of all, an expansion towards the east, uh, which again started off in kind of reasonably well-to-do houses. You can see there's lots of gardens and stuff like this. But then by this stage, uh, this is 1847, these had already been kind of made down. And the whole area, the whole of the north side, in fact, was uh, becoming what uh, has been described as a classic slum. Uh, the whole of the north side was, was pretty poor and therefore was kind of, as I said before, slightly indecipherable to people from middle class backgrounds. It was kind of a mysterious place. There was a threat. There was a threat with, from the working class. There was a threat because of the kind of, uh, the, the, the presence that they had and the culture they had which was different. And there was also a threat kind of specifically labelled at kind of uh, working class women and then from that prostitutes. And as I was going to say in a couple of minutes, for a while the differences between a working class woman and a prostitute were quite kind of thin. Uh, so there was, kind of, there was a kind of almost a, a sense that anybody who was working class and who hung around in a certain area, if you were female, you were kind of almost determined to be a prostitute. Uh, so that's going on there and then that's the later map from 1907. What I was going to say is that the pleasure gardens were there. That was Marlborough Bowling Green there, which became the, the Department of Education. But also this, this building here, which is Alvara House, that was also important. Because during the middle of the... Uh, well, during, during the, the early part of the 19th century, towards the, the middle of the 19th century, uh, Ireland was a highly militarised uh, country, and there was a huge, there was a huge uh, presence of soldiers. And some of them were, were billeted here in the Pleasure Garden, and some of them were billeted at, in Alder House uh, at the end of the 18th century to do with the wars of, of well, you know, kind of uh, 1799 or 1798 and all that kind of stuff, where there was a kind of, you know, there was, a, there was an uprising, etc, etc. So there was this kind of idea of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a military presence. And obviously there is this kind of relationship there. So you've got like this idea of these sites of sexuality, I guess, and then overlaid with this kind of idea of these uh, soldiers who are notorious for kind of uh, enjoying themselves in such sites, I suppose. The other thing is you have obviously a port city as well, and that's, that's another area which is very much kind of associated with illicit, illicit sexual kind of activity as well. So you have a kind of perfect storm of conditions to make the monster become what it was. And it looks like this, uh, as you probably know from Terry Fagan's book, uh, the, the kind of folk history monster. Uh, and you can see that like some of the things that like Joyce says about uh, you know uh, flimsy houses and gaping doors seem to be here and this kind of idea of people standing within thresholds, people standing uh, in in kind of public areas like the idea of sometimes in the in the eighteenth century and the nineteen early nineteenth century the prostitute was called the public a public woman you know so there's this idea about how you display yourself within the confines because the middle class women stand, tended to kind of have to be chaperoned around the place and then if kind of working class women were kind of found to be on their own within public space they were kind of thought of as being a prostitute and the idea of public and prostitution become kind of uh, intertwined. 
another one as well. Having said this, I mean, <coughs> these women might not be prostitutes at all. I mean, this is the kind of this is the kind of situation we're in where we've been kind of these have been described as prostitutes and this has been described as this area, but we don't know because uh, there's kind of the kids around as well. But then, anyway, coming to this, uh, and then there's there's this guy here uh, who ends up kind of hanging around the Monto and is ultimately involved in its destruction. This guy called Frank Duff, who was one of the founding members, I think, of the Legion of Mary. So he, there was a journal from the Legion of Mary, and he did this kind of writing, I think, in the 1940s. So we were writing in retrospect, but writing about the 1920s. Uh, he kind of told all these kind of stories about his experiences within the Monto and how he had helped to kind of bring it down on the evil and by force of his very kind of religious personality and with a bunch of reformers they'd managed to chip away at it. But I think it's really interesting because if you read this language it's very very close to what Joyce was saying at the very beginning. So there, you know, there, so it's about inversion so he's describing this kind of he, he witnesses, God knows how he managed to witness this in a brothel. I mean, he's sitting there in the corner having a cup of tea while there's all sorts of stuff going on. So I don't know uh, how true, true this is, but it's an incredible piece of kind of uh, evocative faction of fiction. They, there ensued what was like a religious rite. So solemnly was it carried out. They raised themselves round in a circle, then silence reigned. The carrier of the methylated spirit bottle stood inside that circle. There they were, rigid except for trembling hands, their eyes staring out of their heads, all riveted on the methylated spirit and following its circulatory progression. It was just as if the blessed sacrament were being carried round a room full of good people. Every eye would be fixed on the blessed sacrament. The craving of their souls for the drink was in their faces. As each one's turn came, the glasses were passed to her and convulsively clutched as if life itself depended on the elixir which was at that moment gurgling out of the big black bottle into the little glass. This proceeding was repeated until all had got their share. Then a regular witch's dance started, round and round, until the little breath they had gave out. So that's not far away from what Joyce is saying, this kind of idea of almost a witch's Sabbath with a, an inversion of the Blessed Sacrament, which is now a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of hooch or something. So Duff was there uh, involved in a very religious manifestation of reform of these kind of sites. But in fact, uh, there was a lot of, in, a lot of it, interest in the 19th century and late 18th century in prostitution from a variety of people, from kind of reformers, from religious people, from kind of tourists and from the medical profession because obviously at the time there was a, what was described as being one of the greatest risks to British security a, and that was venereal disease. So there's this kind of idea that the, 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 the profile of venereal disease was an issue of uh, supreme interest to the army, etc. In France, they actually, well, this is the guy called, uh, I can't remember his first name actually, but his second name is, 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 is hyphenated, is, is Paron du Châtelet, who became known as the Isaac Newton of harlotry, uh, which is, <laughs> I'm not sure about that on your gravestone, but anyway. So he started uh, in a very apparently objective way mapping uh, prostitution through Paris. So you see this map here where the, the darker the colour is the more prostitutes per kind of square kilometre or per street than anywhere else. And then Saint Denis, which is this little island there, doesn't have any for some reason. But anyway, so he starts to do this and he, and he produces a huge book, which is in the National Library, funnily enough, in French, uh, in, in Ireland, the National Library in Ireland, but it has this huge kind of tome uh, this encyclopedia of, of, of every aspect you can think of of, of prostitution from mapping the, uh, the city to, to mapping ideas of uh, where, how, what, where they might kind of inhabit, if it's kind of cloisters or passages or, or courtyards or squares or streets or boulevards, etc., to even kind of mapping the presence of venereal disease on their bodies. So it goes through all these different kind of scales. It's an amazing kind of thing. 
And he was kind of uh, allegedly and apparently quite objective. He was a kind. He came from a medical profession. He was interested in this as a kind of aspect of public health. So venereal disease became related to prostitution, which became related to public health as well. So there's that kind of thing going on, and all that related to the kind of danger it might pose one to male people, uh, and secondly to to the army. And then this kind of uh, induced a whole host of uh, such investigations throughout uh, Britain and uh, the rest of Europe. I mean, so for, exa for example, you have prostitution, its moral, social and sanitary aspects by William Acton, and he was very much a medical, uh, a, a med he took it from a medical point of view, he was really interested in this as a, as a kind of, as a kind of almost a disease. And then you have things like William Logan, the great social evil. Uh, its causes extends results in remedy, and you can imagine, like kind of like uh, Francis Duff, he's kind of very emotional about it, uh, and sees it as this kind of idea of sin, you know. So they're trying to treat it. These guys, like William Acton, are trying to kind of treat it as something which is kind of be, can be kind of uh, looked at and kind of cured. And then you have William Logan, who sees it as evil and sin and all that kind of stuff. So William Logan again, uh, he was very. Uh, very kind of avid in his attempts to find or get to the root of prostitution. So in this case, he got down on my hands and knees and moved along very slowly and cautiously till I reached the other end of the plank. When I felt something like a stair, and finding myself right in my conjectures, started to ascend. I fancied that the people above had heard my movements, for the sound of voices as of persons talking in a sort of whisper still reached me. Arriving at the top of the stair, I knocked at what turned out to be the door, which was open, and I observed at a glance that the house was a third-class brothel, in which I found several young women and young men enjoying themselves. Uh, so he he starts to he, was, he he looked at Edinburgh quite a lot. He starts to read the Edinburgh landscape. Uh, and starts to be able to identify brothels by kind of a, a lights left on, things happening at different stages. So there's a kind of idea about trying to bring this to visibility, trying to make it visible through these books, trying to kind of evoke within this kind of public realm of public culture how, how this thing has to be kind of seen and can be seen. So we had, uh, and this is quite interesting, in the, 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 late, in the kind of mid to late uh, 18th century, we had this thing called the Contagious Diseases Act, called the CDAs, uh, which prescribed the registration and intimate medical scrutiny uh, with a kind of a, a, an implement, so it's an internal inspection uh, of prostitutes in a series of garrison and naval town, towns throughout the British Isles. In Ireland, Cork, uh, Cove, which was called Queenstown at the time, and Kildare, the Curra, were subject to the legislation, while, funnily enough, Dublin wasn't. And that's led people to, to speculate that the Monto was somehow tolerated, that it became kind of there as a place within Dublin where this activity was contained, and it would be something that uh, would allow the troops to enjoy themselves. So apparently, and I haven't looked into this in too much detail, but apparently throughout the British Empire, uh, there was places like this, and they kind of they're almost like kind of like pleasure places for the British yeomanry throughout. So there's like a kind of suggestion that Dublin was one of those kind of places where anything could go, and if you get posted to Dublin, it's going to be great because you can have a great time. Uh, with the prostitutes. So there's a kind of suggestion that like, because the, certainly these uh, contagious diseases acts were really severe and they were really uh, controversial because there's an inherent double standard as well because the females that were uh, obliged to undergo inspection but males weren't. So, uh, and it was kind of, so the, all this was kind of happening. So these were fantastically kind of controversial and throughout the 19th century and then they were eventually repealed I think in 1872 but all during all that time Dublin was never subjected to them which is really interesting because it really make, means it's kind of outside uh, this kind of uh, idea of the kind of military uh, and the, the, the kind of military location of this. 
But, but in Dublin, what you had kind of instead was this. This is, and this is on the other side of the city now, so the, the river is above us there, and if we look right up there, we get to the, we get to the Monto eventually. So this is Westmoreland Lock Hospital, which is a lock hospital, is a venereal disease hospital, which developed, uh, originally it was a hospital for incurables, and then it became this, over time, it became this uh, quite interesting uh, place uh, on Townsend Street, or, yeah, so Townsend, uh, Townsend Street there. So that's happening, and that, what's really interesting with that building is to begin with, it is an incredibly militaristic organisation. So all the governors of the uh, hospital are surgeons and members, surgeons, physicians and members of the military. So there's generals and there's kind of colonels and all this kind of stuff. And that was very different to many other hospitals in uh, Dublin, which would have more of an ecclesiastical uh, series of governors. Uh, and it was also kind of funded directly by the state. Uh, so the state paid for this hospital and it didn't pay for many other hospitals in Dublin. So that was kind of of interest. So there's obviously a special kind of case made for this venereal disease hospital. And at the beginning, it was for men and women, actually. They both stayed there. But gradually, uh, towards I think the end of the 19th century, the men were moved out and uh, it was left to uh, just have women there. Uh, and the building survived until 1952, I think, whereupon they burnt all the records, uh, apart from a series of the older ones which were saved by a surgeon. But, so that's what the building looked like in the front, but what's quite interesting as well is as the building became female orientated towards the end of the 19th century, it also moved from a medical model to a kind of more moral model. And we can tell that happens because in this drawing here, you have the presence of the laundry. So the kind of idea that it became, you, you serve penance somehow, and that you, you kind of atone for your sins. It was no longer a medical, no, no longer something can be cured physically. You had to be cured socially and mentally as well, socially and morally. So that's kind of what happened in the context of this, of, 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 of Dublin maybe being outside of those Contagious Diseases Acts as well. So back to this, and I'm nearly finished now. So we have this uh, landscape which you know well, and you also know that like the uh, Magdalene Asylum, to begin with, faces kind of into the Monto, and then also subsequently faces into uh, what becomes Sean McDermott Street. Uh, so it has two, two entrances and two kind of exits. One in kind of, you know, so it's Jaina's face, if you like. One is into the kind of scene of sin, if you like. And one is into the, what had become kind of respectable uh, Gloucester Street Lower, which I think is now Sean McDermott Street. But again, just to say that we have this really interesting landscape at this time, in 1907, of, of comings and goings of, uh, of uh, people arriving and departing both the railway station and the docks. And I think it was, I think it's Frank Duffer, it might have been uh, Joyce talks about it, it's possible to walk in the Monto and see like kind of uh, squads of kind of Turkish people wearing fezzes. It's possible to see kind of uh, all sorts of kind of foreign people arriving for this point, which as I said, by this stage had become quite notorious uh, in the British Empire. And again, if we go back there, we can see, as you know, uh, all the names, the street names, are changed from here to here. And then finally we see this kind of dense, what we might imagine as a kind of labyrinthine environment, kind of being kind of erased into this new environment. So not only are the street names changed, but some of the streets and some of the fabric have disappeared completely. And then becomes arguably becomes a space where surveillance is more and more possible. But by this stage, in the 1930s, the Monto is finished, but the Michael Asylum still remains. So that's, uh, that's it. Thank you.
talk about venereal disease. What? Because I'm not um, sure about the history of the treatment. What did it mean if, in the 19th or early 20th century if you got a venereal disease? Okay. Like, I know syphilis can be uh, fatal, but at what point did the it's become something which is treatable, or maybe you don't know that. It becomes treatable with antibiotics, so it's not until uh, the 1920s, 1930s. Before that, it was fluxing, uh, which is the inhalation of mercury vapours, which makes you spit. So you spit into, you, can, you, you, you inhale and then you spit, so it's all about the kind of expectorating of uh, saliva. So, and it's like, they have all these accounts of, yeah, he, she's doing really well because she got like three pints yesterday, you know, so basically sitting there kind of, yeah. But it was seen, I mean, it was, yeah, it was seen to be the, the kind of, there's an amazing book called The Feminization of Venereal Disease, probably enough, because it switches for something which is seen to be, which men and women are seen to be culpable of causing to something which is seen to just be women who cause it, you know, which is obviously completely fallacious. But this kind of, you know, corresponds with these kind of attitudes of control that are coming in the 19th century. I think as well, just to say, venereal disease nearly always means syphilis. Generally, they, they call it contagious disease, but venereal disease. There's an estimation that it's 60% of all British sailors and soldiers have syphilis. Yeah, it's a good You ended with the idea that the night going on it continues, the mm. want to disappear. But what, what was that relationship like in the, in the period of the, of the height of the want to? You know, the, the dynamic is, you know, can talk about that between the institution and the context in which it happens. Well, the only thing I really have to go on is Frank Duff, who's a completely unreliable witness, let's face it. Uh, but there was, I mean, I've seen photographs where there's a big cross on the back end of, of you know, on the, the illicit side. And I guess, like, there was a kind of idea, there was an open door policy that people could present themselves at any time at that back door and be taken in. So it was this kind of presence. You know, like, there's a presence in the city, like the Bethesda. Chapel in uh, you know just next to kind of Parnell Square and the Magdalen Asylum being at uh, being at St Stephen's Green. I suppose there's a suggestion that a piece of architecture, an institution, you know, which apparently saves you from this, is there and it's kind of somehow embedded within that. And for for the uh, for the rear side, it was really interesting because all we had was a wall, a cross, and a door. So none of the elaborate parts of architecture could be seen from the outside unless you went round the other side to the kind of, if you like, the front entrance. So it's difficult to say. I mean, I'm guessing they used to kind of pop out that door and kind of hand out leaflets and stuff like that. Certainly Frank Duff did all that. He was there kind of you know, trying to get people to kind of, you know, repent and become kind of, you know, uh, free from sin and stuff like that. But I'm not really sure exactly what was going on. But the adjacency is quite extraordinary. Though. I mean, I'm guessing you probably find other examples of that elsewhere where you have those institutions and in the red light the, the areas which might be of interest also to make comparisons. I think, I think around the time of the um, police report there was suggestions that maybe the laundries were a bit more permeable than yeah, had been suggested and people, like somebody could be a prostitution monto and goes to the laundry for a while and then come back out yeah. again so it wasn't mm -hmm. so much you would be incarcerated for decades. You know, so yeah. it was even though there might have been the physical interface so much that there was a bit more kind of in and out. Yeah, I think that's in the earlier years. I think, so, I think that's certainly with the contagious diseases acts as well. The, the the fact they weren't applied to Dublin means it was more permissive. It was possible to move, you know, and and like Henry Mayhew wrote an amazing book called London Labour, London Poor, and he talks about prostitutes as well. He talks about kind of amateurs who are kind of, uh, they might be prostitutes occasionally and they, they do other things, you know, they might be, you know, shop assistants or maid servants or stuff like that. So it says there's a whole kind of strata of those as well. So it's kind of possible to move uh, for a while. And then the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which came in in 1972, I can't remember exactly how, but it began to kind of make that adjustment really different, difficult. So you could you can no longer kind of move from one realm to the other.
I'm just thinking more of the near early description of porosity. Yeah. How the houses. Yeah. I mean, if, if you go to Henry Street to the Tenement Museum, that's talked about a lot. Yeah. That this, the hall and the stairway are part of the public realm, really, whether an extension of the public realm, where hitherto they would not have been. Yeah. And, and that then can counter or sort of juxtaposed with the albeit maybe permeable but still mm. relatively closed nature of the institution. Yeah. I mean, so it's more, maybe is there is there accounts other than you would say so that porosity? Well, Frank Dodd talks about it as well. I know, you know, like obviously, you know, if you look at Dublin slums, it's into frontage yearly, yeah. all of that kind of stuff also, but not particularly to do with the Monto, really, but just in general, they're like, it's like that. Just knowing that there is a city quarter that this happens in, must have been, you know, in itself, is kind of containing and always open and liberating that that's a place that the private public is all mm. jumbled up together and, yeah. you know, all that. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. maybe it's more city wide rather than yeah. street wide. Yeah. Well, certainly in the chap in the in Euros, mm. it is this, it's like an extension of the Euros, it is like the it's night time, but it's also yeah. night time, so it's a nocturnal thing. Yeah. 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 Very interesting thing to do in terms of um, UCD folklore archives, which take all the histories of people living in families and what they talk about in terms of the women on the street or in the, in the Magdalene and so on. Yeah. Again, kind of that porosity of where they might come from the country and then their relationship to kids who weren't their own, but on the street. You know what I mean? There was yeah. this kind of, um, yeah, it wasn't another world. You know, from the inside, I think it wasn't seen as another No, world. from the inside, so that's yeah. That's other end. Yeah. Is that, yeah, it's kind of, it's, well, the bits, I think it's in Kevin's and Karen's and stuff, like but there's yeah. nothing, you know, but, but it's incredibly, Surprisingly candid in terms of, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Who's doing what or where yeah. or and, and, and kind of maybe almost understanding of people's predicament. Yeah. yeah. Now, obviously, you know, it emerges in Sean Casey, the Time Stars, as well mm -hmm. as the kind of, you know, the idea of. I mean, for a while, the, the, there was a kind of. The idea in the, in, the, in the French Revolution, there was a kind of fear of the Red Whore. You know, so the kind of idea of the women revolutionary had been seen as this kind of threat to the middle class order. And it's quite interesting that within, you know, showing the cases, a kind of different type of, you know, kind of women who's in that kind of role or something. Yeah. But the fact that that was even talked about in showing the case is interesting. Mm -hmm. Are you going? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Godson. Uh, she's a historian of design, material culture and architecture. She is program director of the MA in Design History and Material Culture at the National College of Art and Design and visiting research fellow in the School of Histories and Humanities, Trinity College Dublin. She often works with creative practitioners, for example with still films on the award-winning feature documentary Build Something Modern, which was based on her research into Irish, architecture, Irish architects work in West Africa and as research collaborator with the artist Jesse Jones over the Irish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale Art uh, 2017. She is on the board of directors of the Irish Architecture Foundation and is a trustee of the Design History Society. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Lisa Gossip. Thank you. Thank you. Not that there's going to be much exciting happening in that part of the screen, but I. Um, okay, so hi everyone. It's really nice to be here. I think, it's, I think um, I've done a few kind of collaborations with uh, people in in UCD and Alan Lee on this course that I run, and actually two of my nieces are doing architecture, so um, don't bully them, okay? <laughs> um, okay, so um, as was said in the introduction, I I run this course. Um, in design history and material culture. And so what I thought would be good today would be to say something about kind of some key
key principles you might keep in mind when approaching the material culture of religion in general, um, given uh, your sight and um, your kind of um, what what you might be kind of coming across. So I know that Brenda and Laura were in a few weeks ago, is that right? Mm -hmm. To talk to you about some of their kind of findings. So. Um, so I just thought that I'd say something about kind of ways of thinking about the material culture of religion um, and then go into like a fairly specific history about Catholic material culture in Ireland, a kind of history of it, particularly connected with maybe the time um, Sean McDermott Street was built, I mean I'm talking about the 1870s, 1880s, up to around that time. Um, and again, kind of being quite specific but then thinking of some kind of key principles in, in terms of how you might think about those objects. So how many of you are doing the kind of material culture part? I understand there's different kind of platforms or workshops within the within the project, is that right? It's kind of split between, between like, I'd say our group is sort of material. Okay. Culture, in the sense that we're looking at models and making models. Oh right, so, okay, yeah. yeah. But, but you're all you are all kind of working on the site, you're coming across objects, you're, you're kind of aware of the atmosphere and so on. Okay. So hopefully this would be a little bit helpful. Um, and just to say as well that um, on the master's course last year, one of the students actually wrote um, her thesis on, well, something like the sensitive heritage of Ireland's magic laundry. So she actually looked at the kind of material culture of the laundry system in general and then did um, a couple of kind of case studies within that. And that thesis should be in NCAG library pretty soon. She just got her hardback version in just before Christmas. So um, her name is Donna Rose, and I just thought it might be useful for you to know that she'd done it, and then she did, so she covered kind of monuments, museums, and the politics of memory. She looked at um, the remaining laundries, the sites of sensitive heritage, and then about the affective immateriality of human remains. So kind of like the material culture that may not be um, physically visible, <coughs> and yet it is there, and what the implication of that is for the actual. Um, kind of way this material heritage might be handled. So just, it might be helpful for you to have a look at that. Um, and that's Donna Rose, or even to talk to her, she's currently a research fellow in the National Gallery. Um, and she's kept up that research. And it's a pretty substantial piece, I think it's 30,000 years long, so it's, um, she did a lot of research. Might be useful to look at. Okay, so <laughs> material culture is a term that's really kind of very widely used really in the last 10, 15 years in all sorts of disciplines like within geography, within architecture obviously, um, within philosophy, sociology and so on. And sometimes it's used just to mean objects and things. Um, and just as somebody who's studied it for a long time, um, I suppose one thing to kind of remember if we're talking about material culture is that Material culture is relational and not categorical. In other words, it's located in particular cultural practices. So for example, objects themselves, which seem to be kind of most stable form of material culture, like there's a phone, it's always been a phone, it was worn like this, um, it could go on like that. Um, we might think of objects themselves as, not, as um, not being fixed and unchanging, and that their life cycles are intertwined with those of humans. So this is a very, Kind of obvious thing to say maybe, but it's something that if you're kind of reading about material culture or thinking about material culture, thinking of how something has, how its meaning has changed over time in the most kind of, in quite a simple sense. Um, but then also this term materiality is often used to articulate ideas of permanence, but objects are unstable. So um, this idea that's sometimes invoked of entropy. So if we see an object in a museum, it's kind of, um, it's usually been stabilized in some way. Um, <clears throat> but we might think of um, objects in terms of how they are decaying or how they're even kind of turning into slime and their kind of objectness is somehow disappearing. And I'm sure you're used to thinking about this kind of thing in terms of buildings, like as architects who are designing buildings, presumably you're trying to keep them stable in some way and you're trying to fight against processes or work with processes. And I suppose. That idea of materiality and um, that's from the Magic Laundry in uh, the Good Shepherd Convent in Limerick, actually, that's an image there. And another thing to just kind of keep in mind when we're talking about materiality is that it doesn't just denote physical things, but our relationship <coughs> to the material world in general. 
so practices as well as kind of what we, what we might think of as bounded artifacts that are kind of measurable and so on. If you're talking about material culture, sometimes you might be talking about rituals, sometimes you might be talking about how your senses interact with the environment. Like, it's kind of everything, really, um, in a way. And um, if we're thinking of religion then, um, there's um, this guy, Esperant Plate, is an editor of a journal called Material Religion, which is all about the material culture of religion and all kinds of religion. Um, and he wrote this really useful um, essay or book called Key Terms in Material Religion. So he's, um, and at the start of that, he kind of says what, what material religion might refer to. So it could be how bodies meet objects, like <coughs> so if you're thinking of, say, Catholicism, and you're thinking of um, Sean McDermott Street. That could be at a kind of institutional level, it could be at a liturgical level, or, or it could be at a personal level. Um, and it's interesting, he only, he only mentions objects once, even though most people say, oh, material culture, that's about objects. He, he also talks about, for example, the senses, so smells, touch, sound. So when Donna was doing her thesis, for example, we were talking about like, what it might be like if you're in one of the laundries, what was the experience when, say, new machines were introduced, so different kinds of washing machines, what was the impact on the body? So trying to think of material culture, not just in terms of kind of fixtures and fittings, but rather the whole kind of physical experience of being in a space like that. Um, time and space, so in terms of religion, often specialist space or place, memorialization and so on. Um, it goes on to talk about the orientation of communities or individuals, like baptism, rupture, ritual moments, you know, moments set apart from the everyday. And he kind of says that's a form of material religion in a way. And then finally, kind of the strictures and structures of tradition, so rituals and rules. So that could be around kind of diet, it could be blessing yourself every time you go past a church, you know. So all these things could be thought of as material culture and part of the material culture of religion or a material culture of a religion. Um, okay, so, so in that sense then, in terms of how we might study a material culture of religion or how you might think of material culture in relation to the site you're working with, you could think of the material elements including objects, special foods, special words, buildings, bodies, gesture, uh, gestures and music. So you might think of, I mean, you're going to think as architects how people circulate maybe, but you might think of like the, the posture, the gesture, um, the kind of the sounds and so on. Uh, that might have occurred kind of within the building. Okay. Um, okay. And then just another thing to think about, I have put in a summary of this somewhere. Um, do you know Daniel Miller? Uh, he's, a, he's an anthropologist who's probably like, not just the king, but like the emperor of material culture. Anyway, yeah. Um, he, he's based in um, University College London and in the Department of Anthropology. And I think at one stage material culture was kind of a branch of anthropology. Um, and that's now become like kind of almost the world centre of uh, material culture studies. He's written countless articles and books. And he edited this really, really good book called Materiality. And in the introduction to that, um, he kind of tries to define materiality. And he talks about this, what he calls a paradox, that immateriality can only be expressed through materiality. And he says, and this, I, f I find this, really helpful when thinking about um, the material culture of religion, and especially of organized religion. He says, the more humanity reaches towards the conceptualization of the immaterial, the more important the specific form of its materialization. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. And I suppose this is the, the kind of thing to remember. We always need to be alert to discourses of both immateriality and materiality. And I think what we see if we look at kind of Catholicism in 19th century Ireland is we see this um, attempt to kind of have this massive kind of um, separation between like in classic kind of sociological terms the sacred and the profane and this separating I mean it's happening in the 19th century anyway and there's, there's a lot of kind of binaries um, talked about when analyzing 19th century history so like for example separate spheres in terms of uh, private, public, uh, male spheres, female spheres, and so on, and the sacred and the profane, and this idea of 
kind of the separation between the two um, is very much um, can be very much related to 19th century Catholicism um, in Ireland, and that's particularly affected, I think, through material culture. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. And you can see that is also between the immaterial and the material. So, so then, as a summary, um, these are well. These are the key principles I just tell my students on the master's course. Material culture is relational, so um, it's always about how we kind of like objects get their meaning from how we interact with them, or how we understand them, or how they act on us, and so on. Materiality means practices, so it could so it could be gesture, it could be the way people speak, and so on. Um, not just objects and buildings. And then materiality re that relates to immateriality is generally highly precise. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Okay, so this is a postcard of the ironing room in um, Gloucester Stroke, Sean McDermott Street. I um, don't have an exact date for it. Maybe, maybe you know. Um, maybe you'd have a sense of this. Do you know this image? 1947, according to somebody's drawing last Friday. Mm -hmm. Really? I think, I think it's a bit early. I've seen <laughs> photos of the 1940s, and they're wearing kind of different <laughs> uniforms. Um, and I think the women are wearing slightly different uniforms. Anyway, it's that's not necessarily what's important. I, I just kind of put that in to kind of talk about how, say, if you were to try and analyze the material culture through looking at this image, um, you could identify the material culture um, through the objects, so like through clothing, through the uniform, through the, the nun here on the right-hand side, what she's wearing as opposed to what the women are wearing and so on. All the objects in the room, you could talk about the, the statue, the, the paintings and so on, but you could also think about, you know, this, what S. Brent plate kind of talks about, how the bodies meet the objects, so as I was saying, how the objects are maybe acting on the bodies in some way, um, how about the senses, so if you look at, say, the McAleese Report and all those kind of oral histories and people talk about like, their hands being raw red, I mean, that's a material culture in a way, um, because that's the interaction, the relation between the objects and kind of the person. You can think about how time and space might be organized, so, um, you know Foucault? Yeah. <laughs> Um, he talks, for example, about um, how the introduction of institutions is often predicated on a certain way of understanding time. So he uses timetables as a big example of kind of a hallmark of modernity, you know, your day being divided up in particular ways. So you can think of that in terms of this. Um, and then strictures and structures of tradition, I suppose, you could relate to the kind of the images and the statues here, which really changed very, very little in form over kind of, I don't know, over more than 100 years. Um, okay, so those are kind of some of the key principles that we might kind of keep in mind then when we're looking at the kind of specificity of um, Catholic material culture in 19th century Ireland and how it changed. And I suppose that in the 19th century in Ireland there is a complete change in the material expression of religion. And there's, there's these different kind of factors like Catholic emancipation, economic and demographic change, new forms of theology, something sometimes called affective spirituality, and then also um, mechanized production. So I'm not going to go through those um, one by one, but just to give like a tiny bit of background. Um, in the early part of the 19th century, um, the penal laws are still in operation which um, meant that there was secrecy in the practice of religion. So these have been kind of starting to be repealed from the 1780s, but weren't fully repealed until 1829. So if we think of the kind of typical Catholic material culture um, up to, like in some places, up to the mid 19th century or even later, um, we're talking often about quite crude, quite homemade objects, often made of kind of you know, at hand materials, sometimes almost disposable. We're talking about a religion that has, um, that is kind of quite impoverished physically, okay? So there aren't, um, the kind of objects that we might associate with Catholicism aren't really widely available, and these are actually kind of, um, these are sometimes taken as very symptomatic. So these are penal crucifixes. Um, these are actually kind of, People now think we're actually tourist objects, um, so they're a little bit more serially produced than people used to think. But but this kind of 
quite crude, non-standardised um, uh, kind of form of material culture. Um, there's some church building, often what's sometimes called barn churches, so um, not the kind of elaborate churches that we see later on. There isn't much public display. There is a developing Catholic print culture, um, but up to, say, the 1840s anyway, this kind of um, very, it's not a hidden religion, but it's certainly um, physically or materially impoverished religion um, is very, it's quite specific to the south and the east, is it's starting to kind of develop, it's starting to become more organized. There's more print culture, so there's more kind of standardized information and so on. Um, but that's really in the south and the east. Um, and then in the 1830s, this, the, there's a kind of national free primary system of education is introduced and the state kind of seeds, so the British state seeds control of a lot of this, um, a lot of schools and so on to Catholic church, to the Catholic church and to religious orders that come to Ireland often from, um, a lot of them come from France, um, some from Italy, um, some even from, um, from farther, further afield. And there's a wider availability of religious texts some more fixed and standardized knowledge. Um, and for some people, this is kind of almost the start of um, modernity in Ireland, in a kind of funny way, in a kind of counterintuitive way, because people don't typically associate religion with modernity. But the idea of standardized knowledge of schooling um, and so on. But there's this kind of persistence of vernacular religious practices. So there is there are very few um, kind of specialized spaces for the practice of religion, so you don't have that kind of institutional church um, in a very widespread way. But then the 1840s, the famine, um, this massive demographic change, and you have um, this, um, this phenomenon that Emmett Larkin, who's this American historian, calls the devotional revolution in Ireland. Um, and he characterized this as this massive change that happens to Catholicism after the mid uh, 19th century, really after the famine, because the famine wipes out, the people that die in the famine are overwhelmingly um, poor, and they are the ones that are most wedded to these kind of vernacular practices. So you have this kind of quite prostate kind of population um, that are then evangelized from, by by the Vatican, by religious orders, who were literally kind of sent to Ireland to, to bring Ireland into line with the rest of Europe um, and to stop um, our, to And there's this kind of, um, he calls it, in ter or he describes it in terms of plant and people. And so in terms of people, the, the ratio of priests to people, 1840, it's one to 3,000, and then by 1871, it's one to 1,460. And then nuns, it's even more dramatic, in 1840, there's one nun to every 16,500 people. By 1871, there's one nun to 1,100 people. So you can see this kind of massive increase in you know, professional religious um, in Ireland. And, um, and then in terms of kind of plant, there's schools, orphanages, reformatories, hospitals, monasteries, convents, and then entire kind of urban quarters um, become Catholic, or Catholic institutions are set up. So in Thurlis, for example, it's kind of called the Cathedral Quarter. You see the same thing in Limerick. You see in, in most towns in Ireland, there will be one part of a town that will have, for example, here, um, you've, got the, um, you've got the cathedral here on the right, and then you've got Nurse Line Convent, and then you've got a monastery in Christian Brothers School. So you've got this kind of one part of a town where all these religious institutions are mass. And the 19th century, you know, there's, there's institutions um, built, you know, it's not just Catholic Irish institutions, you know, in, in Britain in general, there's, there's far more kind of specialised institutions, often with a kind of typological architecture um, built, and kind of throughout Europe and, and in the States. But I suppose what's interesting in Ireland is that they're so denominational, so you've got like the Protestant hospital, the Catholic hospital, the Protestant orphanage, the Catholic orphanage. So you've got this, you know, it's a little bit like that kind of separation. So you've got the separation in terms of something being an institution dedicated to a particular purpose. 
schools for the blind, schools for the deaf, and so on. Um, but yeah, in, in Ireland, because they're denominationally specific, that's you know a further kind of categorization, separation, and so on. Um, yeah, and this kind of whole phenomenon is um, is often des described in terms of respectability and discipline, and I suppose those are kind of maybe two key values or things issues um, that you might think of in relation to um, the in, to Gloucester Street. So, for example, Tom Ingus, who's um, an Irish sociologist, who's who wrote this pretty influential book called Moral Monopoly, he talks about the civilizing process of the devotional revolution. So he says the devotional revolution civilized the Irish, according to this term um, coined by Norbert Elias, this, this sociologist. And in the USA, so Emmett Larkin, who, who coins the term devotional revolution, he talks, for example, about Irish migrants going from being shanty Irish to lace curtain Irish. So he's using a kind of material culture um, terminology there, um, and he kind of says, through becoming good Catholics, they learn self-discipline, they learn, um, yeah, they, they kind of internalize um, ideas about kind of morality and ideas about self-discipline and, you know, can, can demonstrate respectability without necessarily having to have a lot of money. It's to do with kind of a moral economy, maybe, of um, how you conduct yourself um, and so on. Okay, and then Angela Burke, who's um, was professor of Irish, UCD, she Irish, yeah, yeah. So she also kind of talks about this idea of um, Catholicism in the nineteenth century in Ireland as being this kind of civilizer um, and kind of a centralizer of of knowledge, and she talks about. New authoritarianism after after the famine. She talks about the furious opposition on the part of the institutions of church and state to uncentralized and unstandardized forms of knowledge and creative endeavor. So she took, and someone else talks about the streamlining of the spirit. So often kind of quite I don't know terms that denote modernity in some way are often used to describe this phenomenon in the second half of the nineteenth century. Um, of which I think you know something like imagine laundry is, is pretty typical in that it's um, it's disciplining, it's about respectability, it's about separation of kind of good women from bad women. It's about um, it's obviously about work and cleaning and all the rest of it as well. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So the devotional revolution you could see it as an agent of modernity. It's oh, it's kind of is that very much. Thank you very much. Modernity, um, even though. Weber, who's this, um, for a lot of the 20th century, he'd be seen as kind of the big um, thinker on sociology, religion, and he described modernity as a process of secularization. But um, other people now, I think, would see something like the devotional revolution as very much um, a form of kind of modernization in some way. So we could also think of the devotional revolution as a material revolution. So in um, Emmett Larkin's essay, The Devotional Revolution in Ireland, He's mainly describing like the increase in priests and nuns, and um, he talks a bit about kind of much more widespread church building, and kind of talks about the influence of particular archbishops and so on. Um, but he kind of mentions in passing um, how various religious orders distributed what he calls devotional tools and aids: beads, scapulars, medals, <coughs> missals, prayer books, catechisms, holy pictures, and Agnus Dei. And I can say these weird, I'm still not sure exactly how they use. You see that little wax um, object in the right hand side? So it's about that big. And it's an actual wax um, image of the Lamb of God. And I think you were supposed to eat it, as far as I know. <laughs> but um, that's, that's how I understand it. And then little holy cards, so like around that big. And then um, scapulars, which um, wore under your clothes to denote. Um, particular kind of devotions. And so this kind of little thing here, devotional tools and aids, and down to Agnes Day, you see that kind of repeated and quoted again and again and again in um, Irish history books or books about the 19th century where they kind of say, oh, Irish Catholicism changed, and then sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll quote this. Um, 
And kind of ages and ages ago, I, I decided to try and kind of test it and try and find out, okay, well, what are these objects? What, what do they do? How do they change? Did they change people's belief system? Did they change their mentality? Where were they from? Um, how did you get them? And so on. And it took me like, years and years and years and years. <laughs> but, um, I finally kind of found out something about them through this um, case study, through looking through um, this, it's a gazette so it was an annual publication called the Irish Catholic Directory. And every year it would um, talk about how many orphanages had been built in the previous year. It might be worth you checking it out, actually, just so you can get a sense of maybe how your building was understood at the time. Because it, it gives a kind of, it goes through every diocese in Ireland and it'll say things like progress since last year. So you can just see kind of over a 10 year period even, just to read the kind of intensity with which these institutions are being built and churches are being built. And they talk about, you know, it's kind of a numbers game. There's a lot about, you know, how many people maybe have um, started going to mass in a particular area. Sometimes it's very detailed, sometimes not. It might depend on whether the local bishop, how um, kind of on the ball he was or, or whatever. Um, and at the back of it then, they always have ads. Um, so I decided to kind of transcribe all those ads for about um, 60 years. It didn't take me six years, but it felt like it, but um, anyway, I decided to look at 60 years worth of those ads to really try and figure out, okay, when is the first church bell being advertised? So they're just ads, they're not, you know, an actual record of the first bell that's now been cast in Ireland, or the first church bell, but they did, do give some sense of kind of the pattern of this stuff. So anyway, so finally, um, so I looked at kind of, from the 1830s to, well, actually to 1900, so from 1838 to 1898, and kind of found that the main pattern was that in the 1830s and 40s, basic equipment was being sold um, or advertised, so that was stuff like vestments and altar plate. Um, 1850s, devotional objects for the laity, and I'll kind of go through each of these in turn then church furnishings, then much greater specialization, and then patented goods by the end of it. So in some way, you can kind of um, trace kind of what the concerns are of maybe the institutional church and then of individual believers through looking at these ads. And at the start, there's maybe 10 pages of ads. By the end of the century, there's, you know, as you know, maybe 100 pages. And um, yeah, so you can kind of just just through looking at those ads, maybe you can really see the growth of this kind of material culture. Statues, rosary beads, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can also kind of follow particular patterns within it. So, um, so in the 1830s, in these ads, the main evidence is that what's being, um, what's being advertised are vestments, altar plate, and books. And then these are kind of, I don't know, jumping off points for thinking about the nature of material culture and Catholicism in the 19th century, kind of more generally. So for example, in 1837, this is an ad for clerical wear rooms um, that are um, Bride Street, do you know where Bride Street is? Near St. Patrick's Cathedral, kind of. And then she moves later on down to um, Essex Bridge and Parliament Street, you know Parliament Street? Continuation of Capel Street? Yeah. So that becomes a particular area for these kind of warehouses and wear rooms or clerical wear rooms and later kind of Catholic publishers. And through looking at the ads, you can actually kind of map out how um, like one particular area becomes a place where people produce organs and sell organs. And it's not really been mapped before. So it's kind of interesting that there's this kind of Catholic geography of kind of supply and circulation um, that develops through the 19th century. So anyway, so, so M. Dowling, in returning her grateful thanks to the hierarchy, clergy, and gentry, most respectfully apprised them of her return from the continent, where she's made most extensive and splendid purchases of vestments, brocaded silks, laces, and embroideries at the most eminent houses for cash. Okay, and then the depot of French vestments, gold and silver laces, etc., 36 Marlborough Street, nearly opposite the Orsi Metropolitan Church, that's the Pro Cathedral, basically. Um, begs leave to apprise the prelacy and clergy of Ireland that she is constantly supplied with every article in the above line direct from the continent. Um, so they're from the continent, um, particularly Leon, so there's a big emphasis on that. 
Leon is kind of the center for mechanized silk weaving. Um, so we can think, okay, so they're selling vestments first of all. So this is at a time that very few churches, um, still very few Catholic churches exist in Ireland. So you kind of think, oh, but they're selling these really expensive vestments because if you look at even, they're, like some of them are 35 pounds and late 1830s, 35 pounds is like a huge amount of money. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly, but, um, and this is, this kind of um, clothing of the priest in these really splendid vestments, you can think of it as almost like a, a kind of a deposit for a future kind of much more splendid church at the time. You know, the church is still really, really poor, um, but it's kind of portable splendor. Um, there's a growing emphasis on the priest as a figure kind of set apart, and there's also an emphasis on um, the impact of the figure of the priest. So from the early 19th century, bishops and archbishops used to do visitations around Ireland to visit different parishes and they'd kind of write their reports on what was going on. And they often kind of emphasized how the priest was living among the people and was sometimes living with the woman um, and was seen as part of the people and was also like taking extra, like kind of could be bribed to perform a quick wedding and so on. And with this emphasis on discipline, what you find is that there comes a growing emphasis through the 19th century on priests and nuns later on as being completely apart from the people. And as, so you have the building of, for example, um, priest houses um, that are right beside a church. And again, that kind of differentiation of space and also differentiation of personnel. So I suppose that's, that's one way of thinking about these vestments. Um, another way of thinking about them, so this is um, a kind of example, um, another way of thinking about the fact that suddenly these really um, splendid vestments start being sold um, in Ireland or start being marketed in Ireland um, is that there's growing kind of specialist knowledge on the part of the population. So I don't have the list here but to be kind of properly robed as, as a priest and to a lesser extent a nun, you wear all these highly specialist garments with highly specialist words like alb, surplus, cassock, dalmata, etc. And you see that as well in, um, this is some, um, you see that as well with altar plate. So this is kind of um, like this one here is all the different ways to put the specialist church over a child or the specialist cloth over a chalice. These are kind of the whole kind of um, array of altar plates you're supposed to have in a properly equipped church to, to be put in the altar. And what you see with say the vestments and the altar plate is a highly kind of systematized group of objects. Um, so do you remember the Daniel Miller thing about the more something is about the immaterial, the more specific the material, the material aspects of it have to be. So, for example, this is a rule, a rule about the chalice should be at least eight inches in height. By way of exception, in case of extreme poverty, might a chalice be made of stannum, which is an alloy of tin and lead. Those made of glass, wood, copper or brass are not permitted. So these are the kind of rules governing these kind of objects. So we kind of see the 19th century really as in terms of material culture and in terms of Catholicism, time of far greater systematization and kind of regulate, regulation around objects. And by extension, you can see that in terms of regulation of space, regulation of bodies, and so on. Um, and you can also see this kind of separation then of priests from people, altar, table, ritual, versus every day. And a new kind of knowledge, um, because People started, you know, if you've got universal primary education, as you do from the 1830s, and you have people learning religion through what's called the, a catechism, so it's a question and answer system. And within every catechism, there will be questions about what is the right um, way to lay out an altar? What, is, what does the priest wear? What are the names of his vestments? And to learn that kind of off by heart, this idea that you must kind of know about these objects, you must know about these particular spaces and how to behave in them, um, is really kind of forged in the 19th century. Um, then the 1850s, you've got the introduction of kind of objects for the laity. So these are just some ads. And I suppose 
Um, this is really kind of helped by um, cheap printing and um, using particular uh, techniques. And so these kind of lacy holy pictures, um, and then these kind of ones as well. And I suppose, as well as this kind of systematization of material culture, you also have an emphasis on getting to know um, Jesus, the saints, Mary, and so on, as if they are part of your household. And this is, um, this is a quote from this kind of bestseller, um, All for Jesus, or The Easy Ways of Divine Love. And he says, this guy, Frederick William Faber, says, We talk to the angels in their different choirs, as if they were, as they are, our brothers in Christ. We use beads, medals, crucifixes, holy water, indulgences, sacraments, sacrifice, for all this as naturally as pen, ink, and paper, or axe and saw, or spade and rake for our earthly work. So this idea that we kind of, we talk to the angels, there's this kind of imminence of kind of religious figures around us all the time. And how we kind of interact with them is often via kind of material objects. So statues, and then also images like these ones. So there's um, this book, Devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, from 1851, another bestseller. So, uh, <laughs> uh, a person who loves another consoles himself in some manner for his absence by the possession of his portrait. He carries it about him, looks upon, and frequently kisses it. So, place a picture of the adorable heart of your Saviour in some conspicuous place, Place, so the sight of it may inspire you to love him and kiss this image with the same devotion as the sacred heart itself. So I know that in, um, in the laundries there's a fair few statues, isn't there? And you can imagine that these kind of little holy pictures, they're really, really, really cheap and people would kind of sometimes exchange them as gifts or they'd put them in their prayer books or whatever. So almost everyone, every Catholic in Ireland must have had like, you know, a fair few of these and be very familiar with these images. And for some people it might be the only kind of art as such that they had. Um, for some people it might be their main kind of introduction, like um, the um, John McGavern, the author, like he, he kind of writes like Catholicism as his first introduction to luxury in the 1930s. So if you think of the 19th century um, and um, kind of say the poverty in Ireland at the time, um, interacting with these images and being encouraged to interact with these images um, I think is, is kind of important. And I suppose there's a whole kind of change in iconography. So this is a sacred heart from about the 1840s or 50s, and then this one from the 1870s, 1880s. So what's the difference <laughs> between the two of these, do you think? Or like how might you interact with one, the one on the right and the one on the left? I kiss the one on the right. You kiss it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's a person, isn't it? Like, this is, this is just the heart. <laughs> and this one is the person. And this becomes like a massive, like some devotions take off more than others. At a particular time, some devotions are more popular than others. So like the five wounds of Christ are really pop, is really popular in the 17th century. But in the 19th century in Ireland and in the 20th century, the Sacred Heart is hugely popular and becomes kind of, you know, it's almost ubiquitous in a way. But it's in the person's, it's in you know his chest as such, and often he's looking straight at you. So this idea of kind of identification of kind of the agency of the object in trying to invo invoke kind of certain feelings in you is a very kind of 19th century Catholic material culture thing. And even the shift from this, which is contemplating the heart, and then this, which is like almost realist in a way, and it's supposed to set up some kind of relationship between you and him, almost a personal relationship. Um, it's very, um, and I don't know, maybe it's to do with photography or something. This whole idea that um, by possessing someone's portrait, you carry it around with you, you know? Um, and so there's just, there's an example, 1883, and you can see um, on the wall there, the kind of sacred heart image, you can see there. Um, okay, and then, um, and then the 1860s, in these ads, you've got tons of ads for church furnishings, um, and that's kind of interesting in terms of um, the, um, you know, you can just kind of trace what furniture firms are, are advertising, what they're, how they're describing um, the furnishings and so on. You also have um, this idea that 
um, of kind of new sensual experiences, for example, incense, beeswax, and so on. So this is um, this this essay by this guy Joseph Nugent. He he talks about, for example, the the smell of the devotional revolution. This, this is an essay that came out a good while ago in a journal called Senses in Society. And he says, a realignment of olfactory references fell naturally within the remit of the devotional revolution, for instrumental in its astonishing success was an appeal to sensory perception. So as well as this kind of almost rationalizing um, thing of rationalizing space, rationalizing objects, um, learning about separation, there's also this kind of very emotional, kind of affective element. Um, and then there's this whole sensory element. Um, and this, this is a really good essay about how Irish kind of sense of smell might be said to have been changed by the devotional revolution. Um, and yeah, and he talks about how religious rituals come to be much more centralized in new parish churches. Um, designated spaces marked off from the secular world by the uplifting odors of prism, beeswax, and smoldering frankincense. Um, okay. And then we've got mass production and standardization. Um, and that's, um, I suppose if you're thinking of the statues um, that you might be coming across in Sean McDermott Street. Are there many statues left there now? Or have they all been collected? And what are they mainly of? Because I haven't, I haven't been there. You don't get to touch them. You there's don't get a, to touch them? There's a few, there's four big ones in the, in the main church. And do you know what they're of? Mary? There's, yeah, there's one of Mary, there's one of... There's a saint we're trying to identify, I think, is it St. Anthony or something? Yeah. 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 Has it got a little... Yeah. There are some more taken out. It's a black robe with a white thing. It looks kind of like a, a, maybe some kind of scholar. Um, oh. In the church on mm -hmm. one of them. I thought I didn't quite know who he was. And it yeah. seems to, the church seems to be devoted to him because he's in the stained glass as well on the oh, outside. That's, oh. Uh, I have a picture of my phone. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> you're so true. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's probably him. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not Jared and Jalen, is it? No, it's Jude. Jude? 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 No, it's not, it's not missing a J. <laughs> All of the uh, piece of French. Uh, is this one of the cardinal rooms? Oh, okay. All um, of the uh, fireplaces still have a little place where the statue would have sat. A little yeah. shrine. A little, yeah. a little like shelf. Yeah. Between yeah. the actual fireplace. And even halfway up the stairs, it's a little. Yeah. And the, 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 the ah. statue that's gone. Yeah. So, I suppose, what's. Reading those. Anyway, reading through this kind of these ads, these thousands and thousands of ads. I suppose one thing about the, the statues is, and it might be worth thinking about, is how they're completely kind of mass produced and standardized. <clears throat> and so we've got Del Vecchio, 200 Great Brunswick Street, um, Adverto and Giacomo Nanetti, and also Great Brunswick Street. They, they both sell like figures of saints ranging from one foot to six feet high. That's their, their ad, say. And they'll describe kind of all the saints that they, that they sell. And I suppose what's, what's interesting is that basically if you have, um, so if you have a, like, a fi like domestic scale or institutional scale, it's the same depiction usually of the same mm -hmm. saints. This idea of kind of standardizing the image of something, I think, is a big factor kind of in this, in the devotional revolution. And, um, and also, well, this is just kind of by the by, looking at all the names, they're often Italian, and, and you can kind of, um, that's a, um, and I guess that's, I um, can't really read that, the contrast is kind of weird, but basically, the Council of Trent, um, which kind of governs um, how, um, how people should kind of understand images, they, they kind of govern that, or they rule that the images of Christ, blah, 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 and of the other saints, um, due honour and veneration are to be given them, not that any divinity or virtue is believed to be in them on account of which they are to be worshipped, blah, 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 um, but because the honour which is shown them is referred to the prototypes which those images represent. And I suppose that's, I think, why mass production becomes really important, because if you're not supposed to venerate the statue itself, but whatever it represents, the prototype, like the original saint, whatever. <laughs> um, I suppose in some way you could think of that as a kind of attempt to standardize, um, standardize faith and 
to, if you've got standardization, you've got less, um, less of an issue maybe with idolatry. So, so what's the point in having special veneration for a statue if it's the exact same as all other statues? Do you know what I mean? So I think that standardization then and mass production are a really important factor in that. And I think it's important as well, maybe if you look at the architecture of these mansion and laundries, I mean, there is a definite kind of typology, isn't there? Have you looked at the other ones, like down in Cork and Limerick and so on? Have you them? Yeah, because it's a very definite kind of typology. There's a way of designing these, these particular kinds of convents which isn't just to do with um, circulation space and everything, it's also to do with what they look like from the outside, like what the facade kind of signals what they are. And I guess the 19th century is the big time of things being categorized, separated and so on. And I think this idea of kind of mass production and, and kind of the brand um, is, is, is important. And I think it might, you could trace it back to this kind of tried out time thing. Um, yeah, and then, Oh yeah, these are images from, um, do you know this thing? Chris Reed? Well that's in Dermot yeah. Street. Yeah, yeah. The, that's where he took the photos. Yeah. So he's this artist who has a website where he took all these photos, but they're, I think they're from 1911, mm -hmm. so it might be interesting to look at how they've maybe changed over time or, or whatever. It's just online, yeah, that's the, the URL there. Um, but you can see there's, um, yeah, Sacred Heart. And you can see this crucifix on the right, and that, um, I don't have a slide of it, but that's the exact same as, say, the crucifix in James Street, in, in the church there. It's the same as St. Catherine's in Mead Street. So that idea of having kind of one fixed image of something, of like, um, and so on, um, I think is, um, is really championed in the 19th century. And you can kind of trace it through, through these ads. Um, and then, I think I've kind of gone on for long enough, but just to, just to summarise then, so in the 19th century there's an over, um, that's wrongly spelled, but anyway, an overwhelmingly more materialist form of devotion. So there's just more stuff, and yet it's much more controlled and standardised. So there's that, there's um, this deeply systematised form of material culture, I won't talk about that, recall to There's a real concern with orthodoxy, and we see that, for example, in a lot of the bag, a lot of the ads, they'll say things like, Miss Dowling assures readers the style of statuary she's selling has received the approbation of the Archbishop of Paris. So if, the Archbishop, if it's good enough for the Archbishop of Paris, it's good enough for um, the Irish. Uh, Miss Byrne, the vestments she makes are based on the most approved foreign models. And then the People's Gallery of Religious Engravings are on the most standard line. So even in these ads, you often see this emphasis on them being kind of respectable, standardised, um, orthodox, and so on. <clears throat> and as well, they're they're nearly all imported, so they're kind of there's this shared kind of Catholic space in Europe, really, and even in the States and so on, um, where the material culture is kind of the same, and um, the standardisation is a big part of it. And I suppose like, this kind of micromanagement of power through through the objects as well um, is something that we might think about. So anyway, finally, the implications of all this. Um, sorry, it's a bit messy, but is um, this massive rise in institutions that I mentioned earlier anyway, like in prisons, mental hospitals, and so on, anyway, in the 19th century, but um, when we connected in with these ideas of typology and mass production, it's really important. Control of discipline, obviously. Um, the idea of spiritual and moral capital, affect, and then, yeah, this thing that I'm obsessed with, systematization and standardization and so on. Um, okay, great, mm -hmm. thanks. <laughs>
certainly in kind of domestic space. But there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of instructions um, about how to behave in church. I mean, at the, at the time, you know, people are really instructed on in how, to, how to behave in church and also how to approach images and how to approach statues. Presumably it becomes kind of part of the wallpaper a bit, like when they're in people's houses, you know, it's not as if you have great reverence every time you see one, you know, they're just, they're, part, they're kind of part of the, part of the backdrop. Um, I suppose having, having that constant reminder though, like in the, in the laundries and so on, it, it must be quite, quite well, different. The statue in the laundry is the really striking one. Yeah. To me. Yeah, and it's so big as well. Yeah. They went for a yeah. five footer no, <laughs> or an eight footer. Yeah, no, definitely. It's it's very much there and presiding over the work. At the same time, they're like after independence in Ireland, like there's I don't know, I've seen all these records of say urban district councils. So these would be like local authorities voting to have, say, a crucifix in their voting chamber and so on. So I think maybe at a distance Maybe it wasn't that weird at the time. It's a convent. Maybe if you went to a convent school, you might have had them. It looked bigger than normal, though. So <laughs> it could be just scaled up, you know? Yeah. Can I ask? Um, yeah. You may not know the answer, but you just took the image of the ironing room from the postcard. Yeah. Do you have any idea why you would have made a postcard of such a room? Um. It could have been as a fundraiser. I've seen stuff from industrial schools from the 1880s and 1890s, souvenir booklets, which are sent out to possible subscribers. So it could have been to, uh, to demonstrate the good work that's going on. Maybe the statue is so big because it's uh, more photogenic to have it so big or to have it so prominent because it's for a postcard. So there could be that as well. I mean, I've, I've seen it with industrial schools anyway, Postcards, souvenir books, and so on, um, be, yeah, being distributed. So, because I think Jessica yeah. Hunty writes a lot about the fundraising that they were yeah. constantly yeah. doing, that it was always kind of working like that. Yeah. So, um, I think the word would have been seen as a great enterprise. I mean, mm. and certainly in the Catholic directory, the way they describe things like, like this, um, like the laundry and so on, or different laundries, they'll, um, yeah, they'll, they'll often say that this great enterprise. Um, I mean, vestments are made in, in, you know, they'll say, best, there was somewhere in Marble Street where they said vestments made by female penitents. So not only, you know, so buying our vestments, you don't just get the best vestments, you also help these poor unfortunates and, and who are being trained up in, in enterprise and industry, you know, that kind of thing. So, so making, making visible the good. Good work that was behind yeah. those doors. And yeah. I'm speculating that could you And showing on? that also, I suppose the statue is there to denote that. I mean, this, I'm just thinking there's a, there, there are ads in the 1890s for lace made in Ken Mayer, and it'll say, made in the workroom under the watchful eye of the nuns. Mm -hmm. Up to then, there isn't a real kind of, there's no kind of virtue um, other than calling themselves Miss you know, on the part of the vendors or the makers. They don't say, we're the most moral, for, for, we're the most moral you know, church furniture makers in Dublin. Later on, that kind of morality comes into it where they'll kind of describe the character of the person who's selling or making something. And when they talk about lace, they'll say, under the eye and in the rever... They say something actually like, in the reverential atmosphere of the workrooms in Kenmare Convent. So maybe that's also, if you send your laundry to us, It'll be produced in these quite sanctified surroundings, you know. Like, it's it's not just that they're they're um, that you're doing good. It's also that like it's you know, God is watching yeah. it, or you know, it'll be that. Similar kind of thing, like to the trophy boxes of my childhood, I remember, mm. like the you know, visualizing you know, starving children in Africa. This is where your money is going. This time. Mm. This is the, the image of that of which you're helping, the charity you're giving, yeah. the, the work that you're doing. You'd have to look at who else is kind of doing the washing at the time, and, and you know, the washerwoman as a figure is, is often seen as maybe kind of morally a bit dodgy. So you can choose to have your laundry done somewhere where there's uniformed, disciplined people with holy pictures around them. There's a nun supervising, you know. That's it. Yeah. 
It's really clean. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because well, there is a whole thing about cleanliness and all that. Yeah. So maybe that's it. Washing souls, washing linen kind of thing. Yeah. That's a good question, yeah. <laughs> but there's a, yeah, but as I said, Donna, the, the student, she she's done this all this stuff about all the different washing machines, how much steam would have escaped, you know, it's kind of quite nerdy detailed stuff, but also then just kind of imagining, okay, so if you want to talk about the material culture of this, you know, you really have to think of the rash on people's hands, you need to think of like are they going to get sore shoulders, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And Brenda Malone was here, she described her, some of the smarts, described the burns that they would get from the, the, mm. the big machine for the, um, for sheets. For yeah, the, sheets the mangles get and stuff. A huge, huge, like four meter long yeah. uh, machine that would um, fold and steam the, the sheets at the same time and they would get burns on the forearms from, yeah. the, from the steam that she described. Um, yeah. Some dump work. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe, yeah, there's kind of, this whole, there's loads of kind of Catholic novels in the second half of the 19th century where sometimes there'll be, you know, somebody goes to England to work in a theatre, a girl does, you know, and that's all kind of code for whatever, and then she spies a statue of, I don't know, um, Virgin Mary and she runs back home again, or locals see their first stained glass or see their first holy statue and, and they can't believe, you know, they're saying, oh, look, doesn't he have a lovely face? And they suddenly understand the sweetness of divine love or there's, there's loads going on about the, real, the realism of these things. And like Knock, you know, the, these visions in Knock um, where people think that they see the Virgin Mary or whatever and they all think they're sta they must be the new statues. Yeah, that's the way. And, they, they've all just seen statues for the first time, like, oh, okay. a year beforehand. You know, this kind of thing, so, yeah. So what's animated, kind of, psychologically by experiencing all this, you know? mm -hmm. and If there are no more questions, I think we can probably wrap it up there. Um, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs>